Hey guys, I'm sitting down with Dr. Trey Cade. He's the director for the Institute for Air Science at Baylor University, and he has a background with the U.S. Air Force as a meteorologist and also a space scientist as well. Um, so that's a lot of things that you have under your belt. It is. <laughs> and more too, you, uh, you mm -hmm. know, you teach at Baylor and you do community outreach for space weather, space science, and we're so glad to get to talk to you today. <laughs> sure, yeah. glad to be here. Go ahead, yeah, so we've got lots of questions for you because you know, weather here on Earth is so different than weather in space, um, and you are our space weather expert <laughs> here locally, too. And how did you end up here in Waco teaching at Baylor? And Yeah, so I, uh, I retired from the Air Force um, 11 years ago, or yeah, 11 years ago. Uh, and um, I was and, and I was at A&M at the time. I was a ROTC instructor at A&M. Okay. And uh, I just started looking for jobs and uh, applying for jobs. And uh, Baylor had this job open up. The the director of the Institute for Air Science. Um, and I applied for the position. <laughs> so the institute was already there. Yeah, it um, was kind of um, barely right before yeah, you stepped in. Yeah, it, it was there. So the the the, um, the institute actually had been in existence since 1991. So the main okay. part of the Institute for Air Sciences, the Aviation Sciences degree program. So that's primarily academically what I oversee is is the Aviation Sciences um, program. So the opportunity to work in aviation, of course, being having been in the Air Force and being getting to be involved in kind of the academic side of aviation, I love. Work, working with college students. That was something I learned as an ROTC instructor in the Air Force. Um, and so it was a, a great opportunity to, to come to Baylor and, and Baylor's a, a great place to work. So. Yeah, and it sounds <laughs> like it was just made for you. I mean, your yeah. background is like boom, boom, boom. <laughs> this is the job for you. <laughs> well, in your position now, you've kind of made it your own mm -hmm. and you actually, because aviation, you kind of stepped into that program mm -hmm already teaching people who are interested in that mm -hmm. and um, wanted to go into that career field, but you actually teach a class that is for non-science majors, correct? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, tell so, me a little yeah. bit about that. Yeah, so when I came in, um, so I teach our meteorology classes, so I'm able to bring my kind of meteorology background into teaching meteorology, but also created um, a, an introduction to space weather class. And it's a part of the aviation curriculum, so you know it's it's a course that our aviation majors can take. But um, I wanted to open it up to the entire university because one of the one of the things that we see with space weather is that there's not a lot of um, knowledge just among the general public about what space weather is. Mm -hmm. You know, what, one of the first questions that I get when I tell people that I work in you know in the area of space weather is oh there's weather in space so you know <laughs> right. people don't really understand or know a lot of, about what's going on and what's what's out there and the hazards that it presents so well even me as um, a meteorologist who focuses on the global what's happening weather wise mm -hmm. I know when we first sat down and talked <laughs> I was like please tell me everything you know because <laughs> I don't know that much about it yeah. and I would love to so yeah. I don't think it's really even just people who don't like know that much about. I think it's just everybody. Yeah. There's a general awareness that needs right. to be taught because it's something you, you don't. You know, you can see weather. You can see thunderstorms, clouds, tornadoes, hurricanes. Um, you can't really see space weather. About the only visible manifestation is is the aurora. But mm -hmm. other than that, it's not something you can. Uh, we really interact with on a on a day to day basis. Uh, and so with this class, um, opening it up, and and with the kind of philosophy of okay, I'm going to teach this. Um, to, to non-science majors as a focus um, with the idea of kind of just broadening the exposure um, to space weather across a broader audience within, uh, within Baylor. To, to, and, and that's always been something I've been very interested in is um, increasing kind of the, the public's general awareness about what space weather is, why it's important, how it can affect us, and that kind of thing. And so this class is a part of uh, trying, to, trying to do that. Well, I got the honor to meet one of your students before. I think you know that, um, but they just had nothing but great things to say about your teaching style and just how much they've learned. And I think it just speaks volumes to you as a person and you as a teacher. Thank and you. so, I just, yeah, I just want to say thank you for teaching the next generation yeah. about space weather. And I think that's just so fascinating. But. Um, also, you know, space weather, you know, you talk about that general awareness that's mm -hmm. not there, that you're trying to fill that gap for, um, but space weather is really not a new phenomenon. Right. It's been around forever, pretty much. It, it, it has, it has. Um, I mean, space weather science kind of really started with the invention of the telescope mm -hmm. in the early 1600s, and people started, you know, observing the sun. 
yeah. with, with telescopes and, and started seeing things like sunspots and started seeing like actual features on the sun and seeing that the sun was actually this, this dynamic thing where there were lots of things happening and trying to understand what those things were and then it took quite a while to connect those things happening on the sun to things that were happening at the earth. So there was this sure. evolution of understanding and this connection between the sun and the earth that took a while to understand because what is the nature of that connection? How, how does something on the sun directly affect us here on the earth and what is the physics of that? And it, it really took until um, really kind of the early to mid 1900s to okay. really figure out kind of how all of this worked. And it really wasn't until the space age when we started putting up satellites and could make better kind of measurements to really get a kind of a full understanding of, of how the whole thing works. <laughs> and maybe, yeah, and maybe that speaks to just like the awareness now and like people wanting to know more because maybe we're using more technology and it's starting to affect our mm -hmm. daily life a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, I, you know, as, as, uh, as, as we've gone along, you know, society is becoming more and more reliant upon technology. Um, especially like satellite technology for everything that we do. Uh, and so that increased reliance um, increases our vulnerability sure. to, to space weather disruptions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just, I feel like I see more and more headlines with space weather and just like you said, that interaction between space and, and what mm -hmm. we do here on Earth. Mm -hmm. so. And I have these cool images behind us too. <laughs> I know you know yeah. what they are. <laughs> uh, but they're some of the latest uh, images that have come out of the Webb Telescope. Mm -hmm. I want to know your yeah. thoughts on the Webb yeah. Telescope. Um, yeah, it's very exciting. I mean, um, again, someone who's always been very uh, interested in space science um, and, and the abilities, our increasing abilities to um, probe deeper into the universe and see you know, things and, and phenomenon from earlier and earlier in the universe's history um, is, is absolutely fascinating. And, and as we kind of probe the, um, kind of the, the, the boundaries of our understanding of, of the universe. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so can you tell me, like, you know, we talked about space weather and here we are on Earth mm -hmm. and a little bit more about, you know, here we are in central Texas and um, we're so far away from space, it <laughs> seems like kind of some of those impacts for us locally um, sure. on space weather and how that interacts with our daily lives. Yeah, because some of those things, while the, the phenomena that are happening are in space, they can definitely affect some of the things that are happening, you know, on the ground. Um, in our country and affect like our, our, uh, our national you know, infrastructure mm -hmm. and things like that. So um, there are several, um, several types of emissions and things that come off of the sun that interact with the earth. And that's really what space weather is about is kind of that sun earth interaction. And of course people know that the sun emits light and but right. that's, a, that's really, for some people, that's kind of the extent of what they know about what's coming off of the sun. And there's really so much more um, because especially when we get things like solar flares that happen, these huge explosive releases of energy on the sun. So when that happens, we get these um, very strong emissions of electromagnetic radiation, um, X-rays, radio waves, things like that that when, when those um, arrive at the Earth can cause problems, disruptions for our technology, mostly space um, technology and things like that, yeah. um, as well as disrupting communication systems. Um, we also can get releases of um, high energy particle radiation, essentially high energy protons traveling at close to the speed of light. So when those hit anything, whether it's a satellite or an astronaut or a pilot or a passenger on an airliner even flying at high altitudes because these things can penetrate into the atmosphere uh, they can deposit radiation mm -hmm. and increase radiation dosages so when you get a lot of that happening um, that can cause human health um, issues especially um, over long with long-term exposures to multiple events sure um, like that and then um, the other thing that can happen is with a solar flare, oftentimes you get a big release of a, a giant cloud of magnetic gas that we call a coronal mass ejection. Those hit the Earth, um, that creates a huge disruption in, uh, in the Earth's magnetic field, and we call that a magnetic storm or a geomagnetic storm. And geomagnetic storms can have huge impacts to surface technology, especially um, power systems. So okay. when, that's when we start to look at effects on like the power grid, disruptions to the power grid, potential for widespread blackouts, 
things like that happening. Mostly the most vulnerable vulnerable areas in the U.S. are going to be mostly in the kind of the northern half of the U.S. Okay. So Why the is southern that? Half, um, because so because a lot of the disruptions are associated with kind of the regions where the aurora borealis is strong oh, and so sure. that's in the northern more northern parts sure um, it kind of makes a, an oval around the north pole um, but as magnetic storms get stronger that oval expands and so you can get a so for example during very large magnetic storms you can see the aurora in Texas. Yes, even, and that, I've that heard happens, that. That happens about once every ten years or so. I've never we'll seen a, it, we'll but get a I've large heard. Enough storm <laughs> yeah. where you can see it in Texas, yeah. actually. And so when you get that magnitude of a storm, those impacts can even spread into the southern U.S. So you start to look at more vulnerable areas where the power grid is more vulnerable. A lot of it also has to do with um, because there are reliances upon like there's conductivity and a lot of kind of sciencey details like that sure. where there tends to be more of those kinds of issues in the northern part of the U.S. as well where there's conductivity is more conducive to helping kind of magnify the effects of a magnetic storm as well mm. whereas that's less uh, conducive situation in kind of the southern U.S. and especially kind of the south where where we are but doesn't mean those those impacts can't still happen if we get a large enough um, magnetic storm. Yeah. Um, for example, there was a, and so these things have happened, these aren't just theoretical, there was a very large storm. In fact, the largest um, storm we've measured in modern times was in March of uh, 1989. Okay. And that one caused a huge blackout um, in Canada. Um, and uh, the, the entire um, province of uh, Quebec was without, was without power okay. um, for for many millions of people for several hours were without power um, and there was a power outage induced by this this very large magnetic storm and so the concern is um, for storms that magnitude or even larger which we know even larger storms can happen than that can happen that uh, you could see large kind of cascading blackouts over large parts of the of the U.S., especially in the northwest and the northeastern parts of the U.S., which seem to be the, the, the most vulnerable parts of our power grid. Hmm. And we are, we you have a lab here that currently monitors what's going on mm -hmm. with space weather. Yes. So tell me a little bit about your lab and how we're monitoring what's right. happening. So, so kind of two things that, that I do do in the lab. One is just kind of kind of monitoring, keeping up to date and kind of kind of keeping a real time watch of, of what's going on uh, in, in the, the realm of space weather, watching the sun and, and uh, you know, watching for solar flares and magnetic storms. Um, I'm certainly not the only one doing that. There are, there are other parts of the, the U.S. and actually there's a, parts of, there's a part of the National Weather Service that actually does that as well, that monitors the sun 24 hours a day, the Space Weather Prediction Center. So they, you know, they issue watches and warnings for space weather events, just like we do for, you know, hurricanes and severe thunderstorms. Um, but I'm watching that um, locally for research purposes. Uh, and then one thing that I do is when we get uh, magnetic storms, I, will, I, I kind of collect data on magnetic storms, can I, so I kind of have a database yeah. of magnetic storm data. And so I'm kind of uh, currently in the process of kind of studying uh, magnetic storms. Okay studying the kind of the magnetic storm processes, studying, and really the crux of what I do is studying how we measure magnetic storms to make sure we're measuring magnetic storms accurately. Okay. Because what we don't want to do is, you know, for, for instance, tell the power companies, oh, we're getting hit by a, by a, you know, a level two storm, when really we're getting hit by a level five storm. Right. Because then they're not pro properly prepared for um, kind of the, the mitigating actions that they can take to sure. kind of protect the power grid. Sure. So that's kind of the, some of the stuff that I'm doing in, in my lab. That's fantastic. I mean, like, you know, we always talk about how, how meteorology and space weather is not a perfect science mm -hmm. and always evolving. <laughs> and so yes. I think that research is absolutely crucial because mm -hmm. I think, like you said, how as we become more reliant on technology, we'll probably hear a little bit more about what's happening. And as knowledge increases, mm -hmm. um, we'll hear more what's happening yeah. in space too. Yeah, and, there, and there's so much more that we still don't completely understand about space weather. So as a, as a environmental predictive science, space weather is way behind meteorology as far as the ability and the accuracy of being able to kind of predict and forecast um, a lot of the types of uh, dangerous events that, that can occur. So a lot of science still to do, 
Um, because a lot of, there's still a lot of questions that we don't have answers to. Sure, and you're here to find them all, right? <laughs> no trying. <laughs> well, Dr. K, thank you so much for sitting down with you me, bet. and I hope we get to talk again in the future, maybe a little bit more about um, the history of all the storms yeah. that you know about. I know you use that a lot in your teaching, mm -hmm. um, and I was listening to something that you had spoken on before about your classes and how you teach in episodes. Yes. Uh, I think that is so yeah. cool. <laughs> and I'll leave everybody on that cliffhanger because I know that is how you leave your classes <laughs> on cliffhangers. We will see and hear a lot more from Dr. Cade. Thank you guys so much for tuning in.